We saw from the food chains and food webs that certain species can have a very great effect on the entire community. Ecologists use the species diversity of a community to evaluate it and make environmental decisions. Species diversity has two parts, species richness and the relative abundance. Species richness is the total number of species and relative abundance is the number of individuals of each species. If I asked you to look at the two woodlots in the pictures A and B, which of the mo which woodlot, A or B, is the most diverse? You would probably say that B is more diverse. But if we look first at species richness, we see that the two woodlots are actually the same. They each have the same four trees. This large broadleaf species, the skinny light trees, and then the two conifers, the thin and the thick ones. All four species are present in both woodlots. What is different about the two woodlots is the relative abundance of these species. Woodlot A has many more of the large broadleaf tree than any of the other trees. But woodlot B has about the same number of all four species of trees. Thus, woodlot B is more diverse. Species diversity can have really important implications. If a community is not diverse enough, then the species are vulner vulnerable to diseases or disasters. One example of this is the great potato blight in Ireland in the 1800s. The Irish were growing potatoes as their main crop, and it was a monoculture, so it was not diverse. All of the potatoes were genetically identical. Then a fungus pathogen infected the potatoes and wiped out the entire crop. Millions of people died, and millions more had to leave home and actually emigrated to America. If their crop had been more diverse genetically, or if they'd had many more species of crops, then they would not have had as big of an impact when the potato were infected. A keystone species has a great impact on its community. It holds the rest of the community together. This is usually an impact that is greater than you would think based on either its relative abundance or its biological mass. Meaning that relatively few individuals in a community can have a huge impact on that community. One really good example of a keystone species is the sea otter in the kelp forest off the coast of California. A normal kelp forest looks like the picture on the left. It has a lot of tall kelp that you can see. The kelp provides uh, shelter and protection and habitat for many species of organisms. When the sea otters were removed, the number of sea urchins in the community skyrocketed. The sea urchins ate the algae. But in the kelp forest, the algae is very tall and skinny, and it's only connected to the bottom by a small portion called the holdfast. So the sea urchins only had to eat a very little bit of the kelp and the rest of the stock would float away, meaning that the kelp forest was destroyed. So without the otters, there was no kelp forest. The otters ate the sea urchins. So the otters can keep the sea urchins relative abundance low, which prevents them from eating too much of the kelp. A disturbance in a community is any event that changes the community by removing individuals. This could be things such as a fire, a flood, hurricane, or even human activities. Most of the time we think of disturbances as a bad thing, but they can actually be good. New habitats can be created. For example, when a large tree is removed, more light is available to shorter, smaller trees and plants. Ecological succession is the gradual change in the species in an area. There are two types of succession, primary and secondary. Secondary succession is what occurs after a disturbance, like a fire. So a forest is burnt down, and then as the years pass, small annual plants and grasses grow back, and then eventually smaller trees, and then larger trees, and the forest will be completely replaced. One of the reasons grasslands don't become forests is because they are constantly being disturbed by drought or by grazing animals. Pr 
primary succession occurs on a lifeless bare rock that does not have any soil. An example of this would be a lava flow that turns into an island. Pioneer species, such as lichens, begin by breaking down the rocks into soil. And once the soil is present, succession can continue like in secondary succession, with small grasses, smaller shrubs and plants, and then eventually trees. Invasive species are typically species that have been moved by humans from their natural environment to a new one. When they reach the new environment, they take over the existing communities. They might not have any predators, or they could be very well adapted to the new environment, and their population explodes. This usually damages the native species because they are outcompeted. There are several examples of invasive species, species specifically in Florida. Uh, the top right, you can see love bugs, which are very common at certain types of the year. You've probably seen them swished all over your windshields. The bottom right is the green iguana. The green iguana is common all over South Florida. It has been outcompeting other lizards and reptiles in the area. You can see tons of these just walking around campus. Um, on the top left, you can see the Burmese python, which is taking over in the Everglades. The snake is extremely huge, um, and it can eat deer and alligators. People have started trying to catch these pythons by implementing catching contests to help reduce the numbers, but they aren't working fast enough. In the middle and the bottom, you can see the lionfish, which is in the Gulf and the Atlantic. It is taking over reefs and has no predators because of its spines. Fishermen are actually starting to catch and sell it. You can see lionfish fillets, which are very small, in the windows of the fish market at Whole Foods. Kudzu on the bottom left is a plant that grows like a vine. It literally grows over other plants and trees and covers them up to outcompete them for light. It grows so fast, it's growing faster than it can be cut down.